Move with me, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And I'm going to ask you to stand with me, if you would, please. Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to back up just a little bit from, uh, from what Travis was speaking on last week. We're going to back up to verse 15, all right? We're going to overlap just a little bit. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning at verse 15, all right? See then that ye walk circumspectly or continuously, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but be understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish or fault. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery or hidden truth, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular, or personally, so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence or honor her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness or sincerity of your heart as unto Christ. Not with eye service, as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And ye masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is their respective persons with him. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we ask that you would speak it into our hearts this morning. And help us to be changed by the hearing. Amen. Speak to our hearts and to our minds. And help us to know the direction that you have for us today. We ask it in your precious holy name, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Okay. So, no pictures. But that doesn't mean the visuals aren't here. Scripture reference is chapter 5, verse 15 through 6, 9. All right? And it says, did I do something bad? It's always weird when the sound man is crawling across the floor, you know? So let's watch. David, what are you doing? <laughs> it's really difficult to be on the, be on the platform and not be seen. <laughs> Even when you're crawling on the floor. He's dedicated. I appreciate it. All right. 
Here's something that Donna and I bought to go on top of our wedding cake. And it had a little, has a little place for a plate that was supposed to go back here. And uh, the plate has since gotten broken. We did make it through the first anniversary with that. But we gave this to the person who, who made our cake for our wedding and said, we want this on the top because we found this, you know, months before we got married or, and we decided it needed to be there. But the cake maker said it's too heavy, so I'm not going to use it. But she didn't tell us that. So we got to the reception, and there's some plastic thing on top of our cake, and it's like, wow, we specifically asked for that. We, we wanted that thing specifically. So anyway, I've kept it all these years. This is our cake topper, regardless of what happened to be on top of the cake. But it's a reminder of the marriage vows. When the man and woman stand and look at each other and look into each other's eyes so closely that in this particular one you can barely see between them. When they're looking at each other and they're giving each other these vows, they're making some promises to one another. Some promises that are more than just simple promises that we might make to a friend or somebody when we're growing up. This is a covenant promise. And the covenant promise is that we will love this other person more than we love ourselves. That's what it all boils down to. We will love the other person more than we love ourselves. When I want to go to sleep because I'm tired, but she's got to take care of the kids, and she's been with the kids all day, I love her more than I love myself. When he's had a tough time, and he's feeling dejected, but she's had her own rough day, she loves him more than she loves herself. And that's what these reminders are in Ephesians. Wives, honor, respect your husband. You will never realize women until you do it, that the amazing thing that takes place in a man when you honor him. Because he knows he doesn't deserve it. And so he wants to live up to it. You honor him and he will do his best to live up to it. Because he knows that he doesn't deserve it, but with God's help, he's going to try his best to be his best. That doesn't make sense in our world. You see, in our world, we are two separate people. It's a man and it's a woman, and they happen to make a temporary contract where apparently they still live their separate lives and do their separate things, and it's all about me or it's all about me. Unless I decide that about me is I feel good enough about me and what I want to get close to him. Or I feel good about, enough about myself that I want for myself to be close to her. That's not the design that God made for the marriage, for husband and wife. His design is that these two that have shared this initial, we love each other enough to commit our lives to one another, will realize that the very next day, which was the case in my mom and dad's relationship, I found out, the very next day, my, uh, my uncle asked my newly married dad to get up early with him the next day and go fishing, spend the day fishing, while his new bride sat in their cabin. It was on the district campground, so you know they were. That's where they had their honeymoon. That's not the best way to start. But I've heard an awful lot of ladies that say, "Well, I'm not going to do what he says. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm, I'm my own person. I'm, gonna, I'm not letting him make my decisions for me." The Bible doesn't say he's supposed to make your decisions for you. The Bible said that you can make a decision to honor Him above yourself and to respect Him. And the Bible tells Him to love you so much that He would be willing to give His very life blood for you to protect you. What's wrong with a love like that? 
What's wrong with a love that says, I love you enough to respect you and to give you the honor that I think in my heart you deserve? Whether you feel like you deserve it or whether the world thinks you deserve it or not, I just to honor you and give you that honor and praise. We don't do too well with that kind of stuff in the 21st century. We've spent quite a long time now deciding that we are each independent people and we get to make our own decisions. I find it interesting that in the last couple of decades they finally decided that the father of children have a right to say yes or no to the birth of the child in some places. since they were part of the process. But we live in a world where we are so hungry to do our own thing for our own gain and for our own comfort that it's difficult to live in a relationship where you have promised to one another and covenanted before God and the company of witnesses we will love each other more than we love ourselves. We will love him when it's inconvenient. We will love her when it doesn't feel good. Because love is a decision, not just a feeling. I read a statistic the other day that said something, uh, something about the fact that love, based on infatuation, that is, a love that says, oh, you're beautiful and I love you, usually lasts about four years on average. But a love that is based not on beauty and not on infatuation, but a love that is based on self-sacrifice lasts a lifetime. Statistically, we can prove it. So do we want broken marriages? And do we want to start out that way? Then we should start out with the way that God decided it should be done. And we will find that He actually did have a better idea. Since He created us, and He knows us, He knows us individually, and He knows us as people. And He knows that if we will do this, that it will be wonderful and beautiful. And when the parts of our body no longer are in the places they used to be, we still love each other and we would sacrifice ourselves for each other. Not because we're still the most beautiful or most handsome thing coming or going, but because I've committed myself to say, I love you more than I love myself. Maybe I'm talking to our young people and our young adults here this morning. Maybe they need to remember that when they find that person, that's the commitment they're making. Not the commitment that says, hey, I like studying with you and we kind of like being together because you agree with me. And we get along. And you make me happy. Because this is about committing to each other even when you have to say, I love you. I'm struggling right now to like you, but I love you. And I'm committed to making this work. Because usually, in that kind of relationship, we have a tendency to look in the mirror and say, oh, fine. They have to love me, too. And we realize this is a two-way relationship. God has a place for a husband and a wife. But it doesn't end there. The husband and wife have a relationship, and the cause, the purpose of that relationship is to continue the family. Thank you for letting me borrow your baby blanket, Violet. Is to continue a family. And so there are instructions to children as well. Now, Violet's having a little difficulty understanding the difference between yes and no and right or wrong. Well, she's got a little ways to go yet. However, I think the rest of our children sitting in here this morning probably do know the difference between yes and no and right and wrong. When mom or dad says yes or no, 
That doesn't mean, well, if they're not watching. You see, Jesus said the same thing that was said in the, in the Ten Commandments and the same thing that Paul reminds us of here is that children, they are wonderful. They're awesome. They are a fruit of this relationship of self-sacrifice because if you thought it was self-sacrifice, just to love that other person? Wait till you have somebody whose only response to a need is <laughs> That goes on for a while. But then, they get old enough to know the difference between right and wrong. They still can't cook. They still can't provide money for the family. But you love them. And you care for them. So, Paul reminds us of what Jesus and the Ten Commandments had said to honor your father and mother. To love your father and mother enough to say, even when I don't understand or I may not like it, it's my responsibility to do what I'm told. To honor them that way. Because if I honor them, they, will, they take care of me. If I make that difficult, it's going to make it more difficult on my parents who love and sacrifice for me. Most of us, as we get a little older, and probably as we come to the time when we're about ready for this, we begin to think, you know, mom and dad sacrificed a lot for me. Mom and dad did this and did that, and they took care of me, and I didn't worry about where these things were coming from. I didn't worry about how it happened. They just did it. Have you ever spoken to someone who was a child during the Great Depression? It's amazing to listen to them talk about their childhood. Everyone that I've heard, they didn't realize they were poor. Jobs were super scarce, and in the Great Depression, nobody had much money. They didn't know they were poor. There was food on the table. Might be the same thing it was last night. We might have had to go pick the beans earlier today and shell them so that we could have them tonight. We might have had to wring the neck or chop the neck off one of those chickens and cook it. But they didn't realize they were poor because their mom and dad took care of them. And they get older and realize mom and dad must have sacrificed so much for me. Because all the time that I was crying and whining, they loved me. And all the time that I did things that I knew I wasn't supposed to do, they loved me. And so how do we show love to one another? Well, for a child, we obey our parents. Because it's a way to say, I love you. I love you enough to do what you're asking me to do and not to cause it, to make it difficult on you. But it doesn't stop there. Marriage, children, it goes all the way to work. Thought a hammer was perfectly appropriate for work. The servant. Now, we don't live in a society where we have the same kind of servant system that was in place when this book was written. Except for the fact that then the master might have actually provided your housing for you as well as your food and the money that you needed. Because in this society, even though they were servants, they were able to buy property and, and own things and all of that. So we're not talking about slavery. But Jesus said, if you're going to serve someone, someone you work for, someone pays your, pays your salary, someone gives you money for the work that you do, you should do the work for them as if you're doing it for God. You should love them enough to treat them the way that God would have you treat them. Not to simply say, yes, sir, I'll do that, sir. That's 
that doesn't exemplify or honor Christ living in you through the Spirit. You see, all of what Jesus is, or all of what uh, Paul is talking about here in Ephesians has to do with us being saved by the blood of Jesus and filled by His Holy Spirit. That's why it's so different. That's why it's not the natural way. Well, I'm not sacrificing for somebody else my whole life. I'm not going to listen. You have to give me a reason to listen. You have to earn my trust. You're six months old, still living. You should trust me. I've been taking care of you. I've earned it. The rest is just extra. God has a plan and a purpose for people. And it is that we would be led by the Holy Spirit living in us to live differently than the natural way to live in marriage, with our children and their obedience, and even to servants and then to those they serve. If there are those that serve under us, if we're the boss, God said we're supposed to be the boss knowing that we have a boss. God in heaven who expects us to treat those who work for us the way that they should be treated. With grace and compassion and mercy. And so God's plan is that we would be filled with His Spirit. His Spirit that would cause us to make decisions, not just do what comes naturally. See, it comes naturally to be self-centered. It's a decision to sacrifice yourself for someone else. It comes naturally to disobey and do your own thing, your own way. But it takes a decision to be a child that listens, that is obedient. And you find that it makes your life better and it honors your parents. Yes. When we live in the work world where we realize what I'm doing, the boss I work for, may be difficult. They may be difficult, and some of the things that they ask of me may be things that are just dumb. But God gave me this job so that I could be a reflection of who He is. So I work the best I can. I do the best I can with His help because I want Him to be glorified. And if you happen to be the boss... You treat others the way that you would want to be treated in their situation. Because it honors God. All of this honors God. And that requires the Spirit living in us. Because it does not come naturally to us. What comes naturally is doing our things the way we want to. I'm first, I'm second, I'm all that matters. I want to do things my way, and I want to have my way, and I want to just live my life knowing that everybody else is against me, and I've got every right to say whatever mean things that I want to say. But that's not life in the Spirit. Life guided by the Spirit causes us to be different. Is it easy? Of course it's not easy. You wake up next to that husband or wife and realize... Their breath stinks. They've been working outside all day. Ooh, they smell. Drop those socks again on the floor. He didn't like my casserole last time, so I think we're having bologna sandwiches tonight. Yeah, it takes. It takes effort. It takes decision to love one another. It takes decision to love our children and for our children to love us, to love our bosses and bosses to love their workers. It takes effort, and that effort is possible by the Spirit living in us because in all of these things, 
God is saying, I want to be, I want to be reflected in you. When people look at you, I want you to be an example of who I am. That's why all of those rituals and things were important to the Israelites. Because it set them apart from the nations around them. So that people could look at them and say, wow, look what's different about them. And would say, it's pointing those nations to the Almighty. God wants our life to point others to Him. So that we will reflect who He is in all of our relationships. At home, in the workplace, wherever we are. Jesus said, the king forgave this huge debt. And the guy went out and he wasn't going to forgive his friend who owed him a whole lot less than that. Jesus said, that's not the way to receive God's forgiveness. The way to receive God's forgiveness is to give it back to others. To love them like God loves them. It's tough in our day and age for people to say that if people only lived by the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, which is biblical. If we only lived that way, society would be so much better. But our society is having difficulty with that because we're scared to death to say that it, that's a godly principle and God might have been right. But as we forgive others... He forgives us. As we love others, He loves us. What we hold back comes to be what He holds back from us. He says if we get to the place where we're praying and we realize that there's a problem, we need to fix the problem. And then come back. And offer your free heart, your freed heart to God. He wants us to be different in the world. And it has so little to do with the way we dress. Yes. When I was growing up, it sounded like when I sat in the pews that the way to be different was you don't wear the things that are in style and you, you know, women wear their hair up in a bun even though other people don't, you know. Lots of different things like that. But the reality is it's always been about the heart relationships. That's right. And about reflecting Jesus Christ in the world. That's what makes us different. That's what makes us different. And that's what makes us a target. But not just a target for the enemy. Next week as we close up Ephesians, we talk about the armor. But it not only makes us a target for the enemy... It makes this a target for people to focus on and say, if that's what being a Christian is like, that's what I want. If that's what it means to be a Christian and to follow Christ, that's what I want. Too many people find it easy to say, oh, if that's what it means to be a Christian, I don't want anything to do with it because I see that person or I see that person. But there are examples of people who live filled by the Spirit, reflecting Jesus Christ, and we are a target for the enemy who is already defeated. That's right. And we are a target for the focus of people to say, if that's what Jesus looks like in someone, that's what I need. And that's what I want.